common question of modern software architecture, to build a monolith or to build with microservices. You probably sit on one side of that fence or another, or maybe you sit somewhere slap bang in the middle, straddling that it depends line. But it's an important decision, particularly when you're thinking about the complexity of your systems. As a new developer to plant-based pizza, I want to take you on a journey through the life cycle of the plant-based pizza application and the reasons we chose to start with a monolith, practices we put in place inside our monolithic code base to help that evolvability over time and how we finally brought that down to a microservices architecture. Hi, I'm James Eastham. And in this video, you're going to get an understanding of the things to think about when choosing to build a monolith or to build with a microservices architecture. And importantly, how to keep yourself flexible enough to move between the two. Software development is incredibly complex, not even just the writing code part that every single AI tool seems to be focused on solving at the minute. Understanding business requirements, dealing with the changing business requirements, dealing with skill sets, dealing with knowledge, dealing with people. Software is complex. And as you learned in the last video, there's different types of complexity that you will be dealing with when you're building software systems. Some essential that comes with the actual business domain, the actual problem that you're trying to solve. When plant-based pizza first started, we had a rough idea of the problem we needed to solve. We needed to allow people to place orders for pizzas. We needed to allow people to check out. We needed to allow the kitchen to go off and actually create that order. And then we needed to deliver that order to somebody. We knew roughly where the essential complexity was. And while starting out, we wanted to remove as much accidental complexity as possible. It's difficult enough understanding and solving a business problem without introducing unnecessary complexity. From a technology perspective, the simplest way to build a system is to build a monolithic architecture. A simple monolithic system with a database is the simplest type of system from a technology perspective. Making sure this single running process is completely stateless so that you can scale it out if you need to. This allows you to scale your system horizontally whilst also reducing some of the complexity that comes from service to service communication inside a microservices architecture. You're removing some of the challenges that come from the fallacies of distributed computing. This isn't a silver bullet though. If you're building a monolithic system, you want to build with evolvability in mind. You want to build a system that can evolve. To do that, you want to focus on really clearly defined modules inside your monolithic system. Having really clearly defined modules will allow you to keep those boundaries inside your system. As well as focusing on a modular monolith, you want to ensure you treat service to service communication with the same care you treat service to service communication inside a microservices architecture. That means all service to service communication should go through well-defined interfaces. Here is the code base of the original monolithic implementation of plant-based pizza. It's written in .NET, but don't worry if you're not coming from a .NET background. Notice that the application is split down into some really distinct parts. You've got the main application API. This is the main harness, the main web host. This could be Express, this could be Spring Boot. This is the thing that's actually going to run a web interface. And then the actual business logic is split down into four independent modules. You've got the delivery module, the kitchen module, the order management module, and the recipes module. Each of these individual modules are split down into separate libraries or packaging, one containing the core business logic and one containing any infrastructure code. This is, this is the actual API endpoints, this is the repositories, this is the data access layers. This broadly follows a ports and adapters architecture style. And then any modules that expose an interface to another module, take for example the recipe service, also includes a data transfer library. From a module to module communication perspective, each module should only communicate with another module through the data transfer library. That means you've got, this means you've got really specific data types, really specific access patterns for module to module communication. You're now enforcing really clear boundaries between your modules. And actually, this is just a different format of Jeff Bezos's famous API mandate. One of the things Jeff was famous for at Amazon is this API mandate. And a Amongst the six things he set out in an internal memo, the first three are really, really interesting. All teams will expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. Teams must communicate 
through these interfaces and there's no other form of inter-process communication allowed. No linking, no reads of another data store, no shared memory, no backdoors. Everything must go through these service interfaces. Now, Jeff here is, of course, talking about a service-oriented architecture. But if you replace the word service here with module, you start to actually see the benefits of building a modular monolith. You can build in this way with really clearly defined interfaces, even if you're building a monolithic system. And frankly, it probably gets even more important if you're building a monolithic system. It's even possible to enforce these rules using tests, using what would be known as an architectural fitness function. Now, I first came across this idea in the book, Building Evolutionary Architectures, which is a really fantastic read, by the way. An architectural fitness function allows you to test for a specific architectural characteristic. In this case, you want to test for modularity. Using libraries like ArchUnit in Java, ArchUnitNet in .NET, and TSArch in TypeScript, you can write tests that test the architecture of your code base. Now, I know this may look like a lot initially, and if you're not familiar with .NET, this may look very, very complex. All that's happening here is that you're specifying which libraries are allowed to have dependencies on which other library. For example, the order management core library, this is the core business logic of the order management module should not have dependencies on the core module of any other library, no direct business logic to business logic communication. And it also shouldn't rely on any of the infrastructure projects from any other modules as well. We don't want the core order module to be able to directly access the data access layer of the recipe module. So you can write these tests that say for any types in a specific namespace, they should not have a dependency on another assembly. You can start to really clearly define the boundaries of your system. And equally, you can do the other way around as well. The order module should have a dependency on the recipe module because, because the order module needs to retrieve any active recipes. And to do that, you want to make sure that the order management infrastructure library, remember it's the infrastructure library that deals with dependencies, should have a dependency on the plant-based transfer library. So you're, you're testing what dependencies should shouldn't exist, you're also testing what dependencies should exist. And if you're not from a .NET background, you can do this exact same thing in TypeScript using the TSArch library. You could say that for any files in the business folder inside your project, they should not depend on any files inside the UI folder. So you can write these architectural fitness functions in whatever language it is that you are familiar with. I know what you're thinking though. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? You already have enough to worry about building software to not have to worry about writing architecture tests as well. But remember, adopting a monolith isn't as simple as just adopting a monolith. You want to adopt it in a way that has one eye on evolvability to ensure that you can evolve your system over time. Putting these constraints in place early means that if you do ever need to move to a microservices architecture, you already have these well-defined interfaces in place. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but at least you don't have a big ball of mud where every single module depends on the internal implementation details of every other module. Once you've got your monolith though, and you've chosen your monolith for simplicity, and you're thinking about evolvability, you're thinking about modularity to give you that best chance of success over the long term. There's one other piece of complexity you need to deal with though, and that's how you choose to run your application. Remember, simplicity is the aim here. You want to reduce your accidental complexity as much as possible, particularly at this early stage of a product's life cycle. At this point, Plant-Based Pizza chose to run the application in as serverless way as possible. We packaged the application up as a container image. And remember, we prioritized stateless compute and we ran that using Azure Container Apps, which is in my view, a fully serverless way of running containers. You don't need to worry about the underlying infrastructure. You can simply create your container app, specify the CPU and memory requirements that your running application has, specify any scaling behaviors and minimum and maximum replicas of the application, and Azure will frankly handle the rest. Equally, this exact same container could run on AWS as well using ECS and Fargate. When we first built Plant-Based Pizza, we actually tried out both services to see which worked best for us. And because we prioritized this stateless container image using a relatively portable database technology like MongoDB, we could move this container image around and run it in different places. Software is 
all about trade-offs. A monolithic application with well-defined modularity deployed to a service like Azure Container Apps or ECS Fargate or Google Cloud Run gives you both simplicity and as long as you think about those modules, evolvability. All you need to think about with this application now is solving the business problem. Your technology complexity is as minimal as possible. This doesn't mean it's a silver bullet though. As you saw in the last video, as a development team grows, as the number of people contributing to the code base grows, you start to encounter human complexity. Microservices came from a need to solve this human complexity, to allow development teams to work completely independently, solving their specific problem, choosing their own specific amount of accidental complexity to take on and to deploy their system at a pace that suits them. And whilst microservices do reduce some element of social complexity, it does increase the technology complexity, not least in actually breaking down the monolith itself. Then you've got the ongoing management of service-to-service -service communication, of coupling, of observability, of resilience. You've got a lot to think about, but that's for another video. Remember, when you are thinking about systems design, ask yourself the question, is this the simplest possible solution to this problem? Across all of the dimensions, is your code simple and evolvable? Is your choice of infrastructure as simple as possible? Is your architecture as simple as possible? Simple isn't easy, but it certainly is necessary. I'll see you all in the next video.